Welcome and thank you for being with us today. My name is Danielle Lund and I serve as Associate Director of Digital Engagement at Mount Holyoke's Alumni Association, uh, where our mission is all about providing opportunities for alums to connect with one another and back to the college. Uh, so I wanted to share that registered for today's webinar are more than 65 alums, students, and friends spanning eight decades from the class of 1950 to the class of 2024. So a spe special welcome to, to folks joining us from the class of 2024. For those who couldn't uh, join at this time, we're going to be providing a recording after the fact. So at reunion each year, we've worked to provide in-person back-to-class opportunities, and we're now really excited to uh, extend them uh, in a virtual way so that the more people can participate. We'd encourage you to enter any questions that you might have during the webinar in the, the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we're going to be looking at that and, and raising those questions along the way. So please, please enter them there. It's great to be here virtually today with Jason Young, visiting a lecture in astronomy at Mount Holyoke. Jason's research focuses on star formation in a wide variety of galaxies, uh, ranging from active quasar host galaxies to quiet low surface brightness galaxies. He's also taught a variety of astronomy and physics courses at Mount Holyoke, Amherst College, and Penn State. Today, Jason is going to talk about searching for dark matter in the darkest galaxies. So welcome, Jason. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Janet Glick, who helped make this possible. Uh, she's in charge of the programming here. And before we get started, I'd also like to acknowledge that this is Juneteenth, and we're going to have some fun talking about galaxies, but um, after we're done, maybe everyone can try to learn a little bit more about the continuing quest for civil rights. All right, so the darkest, dark, looking for dark matter in the darkest galaxies. Um, one thing that I like to ask the class um, when we're doing, say, Astronomy uh, 100 is how many folks have actually seen the, the Milky Way? Um, and unfortunately, this number is going down uh, because it's one of the first things to get washed out by light pollution. Um, but we live in a fairly dark area here in Western Mass, or if you're going to school here, this is a very dark area. Um, so once we get outside the city lights, uh, this is actually a great chance. If you haven't seen it, to go out and have a look. Um, this is our own galaxy, and we're gonna start with a little bit of a, a poll here, Danielle, um, if you wanna bring that up. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, this is a, how many of you folks have seen the Milky Way? And I just wanna get a, a census. It's okay, it's okay if you haven't. If you're a New York urbanite, um, it's practically impossible. Um, in fact, I didn't until I was in my teens. All right, it looks like 75% have seen it, 25% um, have uh, not. So um, again, if you happen to be in Western Mass, this is your chance. Um, and I do encourage you to try because as the light pollution in our world gets worse, uh, it's uh, becoming more difficult to see. So this is our, our home galaxy. And uh, I want to do I want to do one more poll, uh, Danielle. If you can help us out with this, mm -hmm. uh, how many galaxies are there in the universe? Give me just one minute, pulling that up. And all right. And so, so this is something that you might learn in Astro One Hundred. Um, and if you don't know, that is quite all right. Oh wow! Oh. I'm seeing a variety of, of answers coming in. Is that not very nice? And this is uh, uh, this is the number of known galaxies. Looks like ninety percent of folks have voted now. That's great. Okay, so the most common answer is um, two hundred million. The close runner-up is ten trillion, um, and the third runner-up is one million. And so, so as of today, the number of known galaxies is actually just over two hundred million. 
Um, if you're in the 10 trillion category, maybe you're thinking how many galaxies are there in the universe is quite large. Um, and it probably is uh, much, much, much higher than 200 million. Um, however, our ability to find them at great distance is somewhat limited. So uh, no one selected just one. So we know our Milky Way is not unique. Our view of the Milky Way, the view that you might see here um, from the ground, is kind of limited. Um, so we live in a spiral galaxy. It's this classic pinwheel shape where there are these spiral arms that wind their way out from the center. But here's the thing, it's almost totally flat. So when we see it from the inside, we see this band going from horizon to horizon, which is just the densest part of the Milky Way. Really all the stars in the galaxy are part of, or all the stars in the sky are part of the Milky Way, including our sun. It's important to remember that these, these galaxies are basically star cities. If we're in New York City and we're walking down um, the streets, we might be able to see the buildings immediately around us, but that's it. That's kind of what we're seeing when we look at this band. If we could see New York from the outside, we might not see this nice skyline, have a clear perspective on many, although not all of the buildings. This is what our Milky Way might look like from the outside. I actually searched through a bunch of galaxy um, images to try to find one that is similar to our, what we know about the Milky Way. Okay, so we're in the star city and uh, we know it's not the only one and we kind of want to learn a little bit more about it. And if we were an Astro 100, one of the first things we would do is talk about the laws of planetary motion. Astro 100 is stars and galaxies, it's an introductory class that's taught in the fall. Um, and you might think, well, stars and galaxies, what does that have to do with planetary motion? And it turns out it has a lot to do with planetary motion. So these two individuals, Johannes Kepler and Isaac Newton, uh, figured out the laws of, of planetary motion around the sun. And then it was discovered that things like the moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter, they actually follow the same laws of motion. And that's because gravity is universal. Um, both of these are scenarios where we have a bunch of satellites orbiting a massive parent body. And the more massive the body is, the faster the satellites move around. This is true whether it's the solar system, this is true whether it's the moons of Jupiter. Um, and so we can use the motion of the satellites to figure out how massive the parent is. We just clock how long it takes for them to go around and we can figure out the mass of the parent body. This is actually something that we do in real life in the astrophysics class um, 228. So we have an observatory here on campus, the historic Clark Observatory. Um, I've got an image here from a previous alumni weekend when uh, we were, had it opened and we were doing some observations and hopefully in the future um, when the pandemic ends, we'll be able to open it up for open houses once more. One of my favorite things to look at is the planet Jupiter. These are two student photos. This short exposure shows the planet pretty well. This long exposure saturates the planet and, but it shows several of its moons. And so one project we do in the astrophysics class is we watch Jupiter and its moons over the course of a night or two nights, and we clock the orbits, and we measure the mass of Jupiter using data that we collect right here on campus. So it might be tempting to try to apply these planetary motion laws to galaxies. And it should work because gravity is universal. And it's a little bit different because um, in a galaxy, it's all the stuff pulling on everything else. And so it, there's no one single parent body, but it doesn't really matter. You could get the, the collective mass of all the material in the galaxy by just watching a star orbit around within the galaxy. But here's the trick. It would take hundreds of millions of years to complete these observations. And so although in principle it still works, in practice we need to do something just a little bit different. And here, we're gonna take advantage of something called the Doppler effect. So um, when a source of waves, it could be light waves or sound waves, is moving toward us, the waves get compressed. Um, in this illustration here, the source of waves is moving toward the individual on the left. If they are light waves, the waves will look a little bit bluer. If it's sound waves, they'll sound a little bit higher pitched. Um, the individual on the right um, sees the source as receding, so the waves get stretched out. If it's a source of light waves, that makes the waves look redder. Um, and if it's a source of sound waves, 
they, uh, the sound sounds lower pitched. You can sort of tell um, when, say, a car passes you or a train passes you, there's that sudden switch in pitch when it goes from uh, moving toward you to moving away from you. And now this sounds weird to think about, you know, the color of a light source as changing its color um, when it's moving toward you or away from you. If I'm sitting uh, at a, at a you know, stoplight and I'm looking at a street light and I, you know, then accelerate toward it, it doesn't suddenly turn blue. So it's a very subtle effect when it comes to light, but here's the thing, we've gotten very, very good at measuring it. So let's go back to that galaxy. Instead of waiting hundreds of millions of years to watch the stars orbit around, we can just measure carefully the redshift and blue shift of different parts of the galaxy. If I look at this image, and if we all look at this image here, um, I don't notice that one side of the galaxy is bluer and one side's redder. It's a very subtle effect, but with careful instruments, we can actually measure it. In this exaggerated image, we're seeing how one side is actually slightly bluer and one side's actually redder because one side's moving toward us and one side's moving away from us. So if we know how quickly the material is orbiting and we know how far it has to go, we basically know how long it would take to complete a full orbit. We can use the laws of planetary motion to measure the mass. So we saw Johannes Kepler, we saw Isaac Newton, let's go forward to the 1970s. Um, Vera Rubin is working on this exact idea. The technology has improved to the point where they can make these kinds of measurements. Uh, she is measuring the, the rotational speeds of galaxies, is using that data to try to measure the masses of galaxies. It seems like a basic question, right? How massive is a galaxy? Um, the more, the faster, and in this case, she's measuring the speed of the gas in the galaxy, not the stars, but it doesn't matter, it's still in orbit. Um, the faster it's moving, the more massive the galaxy is. So when this project was started, here was the expectation that a galaxy might be 80% stars and 20% gas. And at that point in time, we had a reasonable expectation um, that we had, you know, a good handle on the number of stars and a good handle on the amount of gas in galaxies. And this might be for a typical spiral galaxy. These numbers were not well known for the Milky Way and they remain kind of uncertain for this day because we're stuck inside it. We can't, we don't have a bird's eye view of the Milky Way. But for other galaxies, the ones that she was looking at, they actually had reasonable estimates. Um, and you might argue about the exact proportions, but what she found was more like this where the proportion of stars to gas was kind of as expected, but about 80% of the mass of the galaxy uh, was unknown material. And it took them a long time to really convince themselves, um, you know, Vera Rubin and her collaborators, that this was real. Could it be a mistake? Uh, you know, maybe we've grossly underestimated the amount of gas, or maybe we've grossly underestimated the amount of stars. Those are the kinds of questions that were asked. But by the 1980s, there was no way around it. 80% um, of the mass of most galaxies is not accounted for by the stars and not accounted for by the gas. So we now call this material dark matter. And here are some basic properties. Um, we have looked very, very hard. It does not uh, give off light. We cannot see it. It does not absorb light. So it appears to be totally transparent. We can see things through it. Um, and it rarely or never interacts with normal matter. And that rarely versus never bit is important. Um, we don't know whether it's rarely and we don't know where, um, whether it's never. And I should say, we rarely or never interacts with normal matter except through gravity. We can detect it through gravity because it's gravity is influencing the way that material orbits around within the galaxy. Um, just like the laws of planetary motion allow our students to measure the mass of Jupiter, we use the orbits of the ma uh, material within the galaxy to uh, measure the mass of the galaxy because of that gravitational influence. So I've got an uh, illustration here. Um, this is a conception of what, uh, if we could sort of, you know, put on dark matter goggles and see it, um, it might look like this, where there's this fuzzy halo of dark matter and a fairly small galaxy sitting at the very center. Um, what could it possibly be? So back in the 1980s, there were actually a lot of ideas. Um, maybe it was lots of faint stars. Maybe it was lots of um, black holes. We know that, that both of those things exist. 
Um, this one particular kind of subatomic particle called neutrinos was a good candidate, um, or maybe it's some other as of yet unknown subatomic particle. Those were just a few of the ideas. Uh, one question that I like to throw out to the Astro 100 class in the fall uh, is, you know, what, based on, this is sort of halfway through the semester, so we've talked about a bunch of things in class already, based on the things we've talked about, you know, what, what do you think it could be? Um, and I really like that because uh, the list of ideas that they generate is actually, so it's really wide, um, and almost all of them are things that some astronomer has at least at some point thought about and looked for. Um, and the short answer is we have scratched off practically everything aside from this one remaining candidate, massive subatomic particles. Um, but I will also say that what is dark matter is, remains one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy and maybe even one of the biggest mysteries in, in physics and science. Um, it's 80% of our galaxy and uh, we don't know what it is. Um, so the analogy I might give you is say you're walking through New York City, right? Go back to that analogy, a galaxy is a city. You, you're walking around and we kind of assume that the buildings are made of concrete and steel. What if one day you realize that there is concrete and steel in all the buildings, but they're mostly something else and you don't know what it is? Um, in some sense, it's, it's kind of, you know, exciting, and in some sense, it's also kind of, you know, terrifying. Our galaxy is 80% unknown material. So one idea to try to figure this out, what is it, is to build a really, really sensitive particle detector. And every, you know, few years, we kind of push this to a new threshold, uh, building more and more sensitive particle detectors. This is the state of the art, the LUX project where they are building this, the, well, actually it's completed, but they're always upgrading it. Um, it's buried in a mountain in Italy, and it has to be underground to shield it from other kinds of particles, because all it is, it's, it's a really sensitive particle detector. That's it. Um, and so far they have not found anything, but there is some hope that with the next few generations of upgrades, they might actually be able to detect something. So far, zero. Jason, we have a question. Absolutely. Um, and actually, let me remind everyone, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them as we go. Awesome. How can a subatomic particle be massive? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Massive makes it sound like it's, you know, a, a bowling ball or something, right? Um, or maybe like planet mass. I want to clarify, uh, it's, it's going to be massive compared to other subatomic particles, but still um, low mass by comparison to everyday objects? That's a really good question. And uh, the term is actually a little bit misleading, I guess, um, but the reason we throw that in there is because some subatomic particles do not actually have mass, and a lot of them, the majority of the ones we know of now, are very, very low mass. Um, Great, and that's you. actually one of the reasons why neutrinos can't do it. They're just, they're just too lightweight. Thank you. It's a great question. Okay, so, so I want to um, maybe attack dark matter from a different perspective. While we're kind of waiting for the Lux project to get back to us, uh, let's go back to galaxies. And we actually can learn a little bit about dark matter and about the way it influences galaxies and the way the galaxy influences dark matter um, by kind of learning a little bit more about the galaxy. Let's go back to this. Um, this fact that there are stars in the galaxy, but also gas. So space is a vacuum by any reasonable standard. It's more of a vacuum than the best vacuum that we can create here on Earth. But if we could take a spaceship out into interstellar space, you know, and get out our instruments, we would find that there is actually just a trace amount of gas out there. It's mostly hydrogen and helium gas, and it's very, very thin. Um, but that actually has a huge impact on the way the galaxy develops. So this concept has actually um, come to be called a galactic ecosystem. This, that term is a little bit more modern, but that's probably the best way to think about it, where we have a lot of things going on. We have the, the galaxy um, is slowly turning gas into stars, and the process of star formation is, a, I mean, there's a lot of research on that right now. 
we can see clouds of gas where stars are being born. Um, so in the Milky Way right now, gas is being turned into stars. Um, where does it go? Or where does it come from? Well, uh, a lot of it is coming from these, these flows of primordial gas that has never been part of a galaxy. It's left over from the Big Bang that's continuously feeding our Milky Way. Other things are going on too. Supernova explosions eject gas out. So our galaxy is receiving gas, it's ejecting gas. Um, but some of that actually does fall back onto the disk of the Milky Way and get recycled. So the galaxy is part of this, this sort of system of gas flowing in, gas flowing out, gas forming stars, stars creating explosions. There's lots of things going on. So this is a, sort of a more modern concept of how galaxies interact with their environment. All right, let's go forward in time a little bit and uh, meet some other characters. Um, you know me, I am a grad student in 2012, just finishing grad school at Penn State. Here's an aerial shot where uh, I think, yeah, right here, we can see the science building with the two observatory domes uh, on the rooftop, which house telescopes that are fraction of the age of ours just here at Mount Holyoke, despite the fact that ours is still fully operational. Um, Sharon Wang is my um, office mate. She's now at the Carnegie DTM. And this other individual, Rejo Cusio Denari, came to Penn State and gave a talk about a galaxy type that seems to defy the concept of galactic ecosystem. So we have two galaxies side by side in comparison. Uh, the one on the left is a normal galaxy, a normal spiral, um, and it's called a high surface brightness spiral. The one on the right is a low surface brightness spiral. Now, these two galaxies have a similar size. They have similar overall mass, probably similar dark matter content, similar normal matter content, but here's the difference. Um, the one on the left is forming stars efficiently. It's turned about 80% of its gas into stars. The one on the right is not forming stars inefficiently. It's actually gas rich. It has maybe 50 to 80% gas fraction. Um, so lots of gas to form stars with, but it's not really doing anything with it. It's got a few stars. That's why you can see it at all, but it's still mostly gas. So it's well fed, but it's not doing anything with it. Um, and because it's so faint and diffuse, we call them low surface brightness galaxies. I was fascinated by this because imagine you're in a room and you're talking to some people, um, maybe four or five people, and then suddenly you realize there's like 20 other really quiet people in the room that you didn't hear, you didn't see. Who are they? What's their story? You know, why are they so quiet? That's, that's the real universe. These galaxies are underrepresented in surveys because they're hard to see, and we don't understand why they defy this concept of galactic ecosystem. And so my research right now focuses a lot on them, and I have a bunch of students working with me on different projects concerning low surface brightness galaxies. Um, but today we'll talk about how they actually tell us something intriguing about dark matter. So here's a, here's a montage of some of the objects we're looking at. Um, the surface brightnesses vary. Some of them are extreme. Some of them are, are more modest. Uh, we'll see a few more of them. Uh, they're not a rare type of galaxy. They're actually pretty common. And so one wrinkle with that 200 million galaxies at the very beginning when we did that poll, that's known galaxies. And the known aspect is really important because how many low surface brightness galaxies are there? It's hard to say. So if we're going to study dark matter, uh, then this is a great place to look because trying to estimate the contribution of dark matter is hard at the very center of the galaxy when there's a lot of normal matter too. But in these guys, these low surface brightness galaxies, uh, the normal matter is more spread out. And so it's easier to get a handle on the dark matter. Back in the 1990s, people did this and started looking really, really carefully um, at the dark matter halos in, or the, the dark matter cloud that surrounds low surface brightness galaxies because they were really easy to study for that reason. Once we realized that this neat type of galaxy is out there, this became a great place to test our ideas about dark matter. So let's go back to one of the basic properties about dark matter, right? In theory, it doesn't interact with anything except through gravity. You know, if this is true, computer simulations tell us that 
the structure of the dark matter halo should look something like this diagram right here, um, where it's it, at the very outskirts, it's very diffuse, we go toward the center of the galaxy, denser, 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 denser until it reaches a, very, a cusp at the center where it's really dense, and then it tapers off on the other side. A um, couple analogies we could make, um, this is sort of like a sharp mountain peak where you climb up the slope, it gets steeper, steeper, steeper until the peak, and then it descends on the other side. This is what we would expect if our theories about dark matter are correct, and the dark matter is forming and the galaxy kind of forms around it. When people started measuring it though, what they found was more like this illustration, where as we start in the outskirts of the galaxy, the dark matter gets slowly denser, ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, um, kind of like the other one, but then at the very center, instead of reaching that sharp cusp, kind of plateaus off and it's, it's, it's more like a rolling rounded hill um, where, you know, it does go up and there is, there is a top and it's never totally flat, but if you're on the top of Mount Greylock walking around, you might, you know, at the very top, you're surrounded by trees or something. If you didn't know you were on a mountain, if you're not actually looking off the cliff, you might think you're on flat ground. If you're in the middle of this galaxy, then you and you're measuring, if you could somehow measure the dark matter, you know, density, you might not notice that uh, it's not constant. You might think this is kind of a, a flat area. Um, this is all called a chord halo. So these ones on the left are what we expect from theory if our ideas about the dark matter are right. The one on the right is what people kept finding over and over and over again when they measured it. And so what's the deal here? Well, there were a couple of ideas tossed out, um, but by 2013, this paper had come out, which I think is probably one of the real landmarks um, in this uh, paradox. And so I wanna, I wanna walk through what their theory about the core cusp paradox was. Um, the idea is that dark matter is actually the way we think it is. It really doesn't interact with anything other than gravity. So when the galaxy first forms, it does have this initial cuspy halo where it's very, very dense at the center. Um, then a bunch of stars form at the very center of the galaxy. There's a burst of star formation. The stars don't directly influence the dark matter, but the energy does push gas clouds away from the center of the galaxy. Um, and then the gas clouds gravitationally drag dark matter with them. So remember, dark matter doesn't interact with anything except through gravity. So gravity is fair game. You know, the, the clouds can put, pull dark matter away from the center and you end up with a chord halo. This transforms the galaxy from cuspy to chord. Uh, okay, so this was the idea. So one neat thing we can do with the, the research that I'm doing um, here at Mount Holyoke um, and that my collaborators and students are working on is we can test this idea. So, we're gonna, we're gonna try to test this as a possible solution to this paradox. Um, this is something that Sharon and I got interested in. We started working with Rachel. And to do this, we're gonna um, use a couple of different telescopes. Uh, one of them is the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, so it is an infrared telescope. It actually was deactivated um, just a little while ago. Um, it ran for many, many years, um, taking pictures of galaxies in the infrared or actually taking pictures of many things in the infrared, but we're gonna be looking at pictures of galaxies. And this is really good because it tells us where the old stars are. Um, we're also gonna use data from the Swift Gamma Ray Burst Explorer Telescope. So gamma ray bursts are explosions that occur in the universe. Um, they give off bright you know, gamma ray flashes. And for a long time, it was a real mystery what they were because these, these gamma ray telescopes would detect them and people would try to you know, point their normal telescopes at the gamma ray burst, but it goes so fast. Um, so eventually NASA built this um, satellite that has an X-ray telescope and a normal optical UV telescope co-sighted. And so as soon as it detects a gamma ray burst, it immediately slews to it. Um, and so that actually resolved the question, what are gamma ray bursts? However, when there's no gamma ray burst going on, uh, you can use it for other things. And so we use the UV um, imaging capabilities to take ultraviolet pictures of our galaxies. Um, here is one of the ones that we collected. And it's the same galaxy in the infrared and ultraviolet pictures. You might notice it takes on this almost skeletal appearance. 
um, these are places where stars are forming uh, versus the old stars. One more telescope we're going to need to help crack this problem is down in Texas, the McDonald Observatory. Um, so actually last February, I traveled down there with a Mount Holyoke student um, to collect data on one of our galaxies for four nights. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to do so again in the near future. So with this telescope, uh, we are, and actually here's, here's me on a previous observing run with two Amherst College students. Um, we're gonna be using the spectrograph, which is this uh, triangular device that's attached to the telescope on the side. And so instead of taking pictures of galaxies, we're gonna be taking, in, in say three colors, like an RGB image, we're gonna be taking pictures in like a thousand colors at once um, by taking a spectrum at every single point in the image. And let me uh, show you how that works. So we collect data with the telescope uh, and instead of having a camera at the focal plane, they've got this um, bundle of optical fibers, which each map out a different part of the galaxy. And for each of these fibers, we get to look at the spectrum. Like we take the colors and we spread it out into the rainbow. And this is data that we, we collect, right? So we can measure how bright the sky is at different wavelengths. And every tiny little wavelength becomes uh, an image. So we know how bright the galaxy is at all these different wavelengths, at all these different colors. So with all this information combined, we can actually model the history of this galaxy. So there's this idea that there was this burst of star formation that shocked these clouds and pushed them away from the center of the galaxy, uh, and that dragged dark matter with it. Now, if that's true, the stars that formed in that burst should still be there, or at least some of them. Some of them have burned out, uh, but many of them are still there. And we should still be able to detect their light. And with this kind of analysis, tell exactly when they formed and check this idea. So our first galaxy that we're going to look at is a low surface brightness galaxy, UGC 628. Um, this is a deep image of it. So it looks like a high surface brightness galaxy here, but that's because um, Rachel went to the telescope. She took some really long exposures. So this is a really good image of this galaxy. It's a barred spiral, it's 255 million light years away, similar in mass to the Milky Way, only it's a low surface brightness galaxy. And we're gonna look at the, we're gonna, we took all the data, we analyzed it, we put together a movie of the life cycle of this galaxy. And so we, like, we're sort of playing this kind of um, game of galactic archeology span where we can use the data to piece together what it was like in the past. Um, a couple of things about the movie we're going to watch. Uh, there's a couple of foreground stars that we had to mask out because they contaminate the light. And then there's also a background galaxy that we're actually seeing through uh, our galaxy. So we had to mask that out too. So we're going to watch a movie and there's a couple of sort of chunks taken out of it. Um, there's nothing we can do to get those chunks back. Those are simply contaminated data. The other thing to remember about this movie is that we're looking at where this what the stars would have looked like if we could go back in time and see them back then, except at their current positions. Remember that everything within the galaxy is moving and we can't unspin it. We can't you know, wind it backwards. So it's the light of the stars as it would have looked back then, only at their current locations. All right, so this is, um, this is the history of this galaxy um, derived from the, um, the data that we collected with those three different telescopes. We're gonna start 10 billion years ago and count forward in time. It starts off with that really bright burst of star formation at the center, um, and then that kind of fades out. There was star formation elsewhere through the galaxy. Um, then there's another sort of halo of star formation around the edges that fades out, and then it goes through this period that um, I'm calling the, the dark ages of UGC 6 to 8, where not a whole lot happens. We get a little bit more activity flaring up in the last couple of billion years. Notice the time ticker is slowing down. We have better temporal resolution um, at more recent times. So we can sort of tell you with better detail what happened recently. One thing that's happening recently in the history of this galaxy is that the star formation is predominantly along the edges of the galaxy. That was a burst of star formation about a billion years ago. It's gonna go quiet again. And then around 50 million years ago, um, 
it's going to flare up again around the edges. And we could do an entire talk about this. I, we call it the burst gasp cycle. It's not totally well understood why they, why low surface brightness galaxies seem to do this, um, but there's growing evidence that it's a common phenomenon. 200 million years before present. And this is 200 million years plus the 255 million years of look back time because this galaxy is 255 million years ago. Or light years away. So it's kind of waking up again, going through another burst of activity, and it's going to end up being the blue, the star formation is going to be predominantly near the edges. And that basically brings us up to present day. Okay, so an initial burst of centralized star formation that's kind of like what we expected from the models. Then, in the around five and a half billion years ago, we see star formation again, but it's only in this sort of circumnuclear ring. So what this tells us is that this early burst of star formation actually did expel gas from the core because the only place where there's gas left is in this ring around the core. In my opinion, this actually verifies this idea that this galaxy really did drive gas from its center um, early on in its history. And that could be uh, when it restructured its dark matter halo. And so for the first time, we're actually seeing real evidence that actual galaxies, the, the normal matter can push the dark matter around gravitationally or pull it around gravitationally. Then we have the galactic dark ages, um, and I, we do see some low surface brightness galaxies that might be analogs to what this guy was going through in that time period. And I'm actually very interested in trying to follow these up and sort of look at them really carefully and say, are they really the same? Um, and then this, uh, the current mode of star formation seems to be in clumps near the edges. And we also see other low surface brightness galaxies that might be going through a similar phase right now. So maybe this is a typical life cycle for these, uh, these darkest galaxies, these low surface brightness galaxies. And this could explain how they end up reshaping their dark matter halos. One follow-up that I want to do is there's this other one in our sample, UGC731. Um, based on preliminary data, I think it actually might never have experienced that early burst. And if that's true, um, there's a good chance we might be able to catch it still with this primordial cusky halo. Um, and if that's true, that would actually back up a lot of our theories about dark matter. Like, for example, it cannot interact with anything except through gravity. That would be a real landmark. Um, and as of right now, we have the data to check this idea, and we're in the process of checking it. Okay, so to sum up, um, this is a great place, dark matter halos if they really don't uh, interact with anything except through gravity, um, then galaxies with very few stars might have these primordial halos because that means that they didn't experience that early burst of star formation. And we could also expect there to be a relationship between the stars and the dark matter halo because if they're really feeding back on each other, we could maybe see a correlation. Those are things that um, I'm working on checking and other students that I'm working with are, are are working on different aspects of that project. I've got a few students now who are working on the infrared aspect of the project. Um, a couple more students who are doing different things. Uh, we're kind of put the pieces together, uh, but I think this could actually be a really significant clue as to the nature of dark matter while we'll, we're waiting for the Lux experiment to get back to us. Um, and I'll end there and uh, open the floor for any questions that we might have. So we'd encourage folks, if you have a question, to just go ahead and enter it into the chat box. Thanks so much, Jason, for putting this, this together for us today. And just curious, what are the courses that you teach at Mount Holyoke specifically right now? Sure. So in the fall, we're offering Astro 100, that Stars and Galaxies course, um, which is designed for non-STEM majors. If you are or think you might be a STEM major, you're certainly welcome to take it. Um, if you're, say, a history major but want to take one course in astronomy, um, that's a great course. It's, it's designed for folks like that. Um, then in the spring, we teach a parallel intro course 102, 
um, solar systems where we focus on the planets of our solar system and other solar systems. In the fall, the major track course is going to be Astro 226 cosmology, where we zoom out and look at the universe on the largest possible scales. That is a major track course, but it has very few prerequisites. It's designed for a physics, astronomy, math major who maybe is a freshman or sophomore, and they're just getting started. Um, then in the spring is when we have Astro 228, uh, which is the one where we previously did observations of Jupiter. And that's um, Astrophysics 1. It's, it's an overall like kind of nuts and bolts course for astronomy. What are, what are the basic concepts that we're going to need if you want to be a major going forward? Um, and I have to caveat this. We're not going to be doing the Jupiter uh, lab this year because Jupiter is not visible in the springtime sky anymore. But we'll probably do a parallel lab where we, we do some observations with the telescope. Awesome. Thanks so much. We have some great questions coming through. Um, so I will say there was a question about, can we view this again? Yes, there's going to be a recording um, available and I'll be sure to share the link to where we're going to post the recording. Um, question, does your study of dark matter intersect with the search for life in other galaxies? Uh, well, not, not directly. And so I think that questions in astronomy can basically be broken up into two categories. Um, are we alone? And where did we come from? And my work focuses mostly on the, you know, where did we come from aspect? You know, why did our Milky Way turn out the way that it did? The only way we can know is by looking at other kinds of galaxies and seeing you know, what are the differences? What are the evolutionary paths for galaxies? Um, and the way that factors into the search for life is, uh, you know, our Milky Way seems to be a very hospitable galaxy. Um, how important is dark matter to that? You know, how important is dark matter to the fact that we are, Earth is here? Um, and for example, let's look at low surface brightness galaxies for a second. Uh, so in the vastness of the universe, there's probably at least some life in low surface brightness galaxies. However, generally speaking, I would say that they're probably terrible places to look. Um, because they're deficient in heavy elements like carbon and oxygen um, and iron. And so in some sense, I would say that the, the most significant way in which my study affects the search for life is I am looking at places that are absolutely terrible for life. And so if you want to understand why the Milky Way is habitable, it's good to look at these places too. Awesome. Um, a question about the, the imagery. How do you get the timed photos, uh, given that we obviously weren't around to take them at the time? <laughs> yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, not the movie, but it's, it's really this data combined with the UV um, and the IR data from space. So every little part of the spectrum tells us something different about the stars that are there today. Um, so every little piece, every, the brightness at every color tells us something about the stars that are there today. So in the past, say 10 billion years ago, we saw that, that frame where it was forming stars in the very center. Let's look at the very center of the galaxy. Many of the stars that formed there 10 billion years ago have burned out. Many of them are still there today. And the light that we can see in the center of the galaxy today is partly coming from those stars. So we look at the light at the very center of the galaxy and we sort of take it apart. How much of it is going to come, like how much of it has the, the very special signature of, of young stars versus how much of it has a signature of older stars. And so we can decompose it into its pieces uh, and say, well, if uh, say 90% of it is coming from stars that are around 10 billion years old, then we can work backwards and say that I know there must have been a burst of star formation there 10 billion years ago. And uh, I know what that would have looked like. Um, and then do the same for every little location in the galaxy and effectively create a snapshot of what the galaxy would have looked like 10 billion years ago. Um, stars and starlight is, we're very, very lucky in the sense that it is rich in information. And if you look at it with this thousand color image that we can create with this um, instrument down in Texas, we can get a lot of information out of it. 
and, and really play the game of galactic archaeology and go backwards. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and perhaps this relates to the first question we had, but what would uh, be the practical applications of the discovery of the properties of dark matter? It probably depends heavily on what, what dark matter ends up being. Um, you know, could we use it for some technology here on Earth? Maybe. Um, could we do something else with it? Maybe. Um, if we could find, if, in, so maybe the rule it never interacts with normal matter is not strict. If under some circumstances it does, maybe we could use it for signaling, who knows? Um, at this point, the people that are working on dark matter are working on it, um, like myself, uh, just because we're super interested in learning about a basic aspect of the universe. Um, it will probably be a long time before that kicks back to any practical aspect. Uh, and so right now it's really being driven by just curiosity. Um, but you never know. Uh, the history is filled with discoveries that were made in the abstract um, and later turned out to have massive practical applications. It's also filled with, with discoveries that were made in the abstract that so far have not yet. So maybe there never will be a practical application. Who knows? Wait to how, see how it unfolds. I'll just see, see how it unfolds. I mean, remember that, that the uh, experiments that were being done with electricity and magnetism back in the uh, early 19th century, that was considered to be a novelty, right? Hmm. Right. Now that's our entire world. True. Um, what is the AGN doing in this galaxy? Do you think this galaxy's AGN might have influence uh, in the suppression and trigger of star formation over time? And maybe you can share what AGN is for those who might not know, like myself. <laughs> yeah, so it's an active galactic nucleus. Okay. So one thing we didn't talk about um, today is the fact that most galaxies um, have a black hole at the very center. So at the center of our Milky Way, there's a black hole that's 4 million times the mass of our sun. So it's, it's a very massive object, although still a small fraction of the total mass of the galaxy. Uh, it's not the only black hole in the galaxy. There are thousands, but it's certainly the most massive. And it turns out that although these, these supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies account for only a small fraction of the galaxy's mass, they can have a huge impact on how the galaxy develops. Um, one thing that can happen is um, if gas and material starts to fall into the black hole, it can uh, pile up, right? So it's trying to fall into the black hole, but it piles up and has to kind of wait in line. And while it's waiting in line, it forms this disk of material around the black hole. It's called an accretion disk. And the material gets compressed and heated up. So what you get is this disk of glowing gas waiting in line to fall into the black hole that's the size of our solar system, but as hot as the center of the sun. And that gives off more light and more heat than the entire galaxy combined. And that's called an active galactic nucleus, or in the extreme case, it's called a quasar. And that energy can actually expel gas from the center of um, the galaxy, or sometimes even entirely from the galaxy. It can radically change the galactic ecosystem for that particular galaxy. So the question is, uh, could the black hole at the center of UGC 628 or other low surface brightness galaxies have influenced them? And the answer is, uh, we don't know. So I can tell you where stars formed in the past, but I cannot tell you when the black hole might have been active, or even for sure if there is one. Uh, what we do know is that low surface brightness galaxies, although most major galaxies have a supermassive black hole, not all do, it's not a strict rule, and low surface brightness galaxies tend not to. They are more likely than average to not have a supermassive black hole. And so I can't say with confidence that the supermassive black hole didn't have an impact on this galaxy, but I can say with confidence that the supermassive black holes um, categorically can't explain all the properties of low surface brightness galaxies. We can't just say the black hole has drove the gas out and that's what did it, um, because a lot of them don't have one. Uh, and so I am actually very interested in trying to see if I can find out if there's a supermassive black hole in this particular galaxy, because that could be a key piece of the story. Mm. The problem is that they're almost impossible to find 
unless they're feeding, in which case they're really bright. So all I can say is there's not a feeding black hole there, but is there one at all? Maybe. Very interesting. Interesting. Um, a question on planetary bodies. What's the difference between a sun and a star and a planet? Sure. So uh, the difference between a star and a planet um, is based on nuclear fusion. Our sun is giving off light generated by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. It's converting hydrogen into helium in a nuclear reaction. So our sun is basically a nuclear reactor. Uh, and that is the basic characteristic of stars, that they are, they are nuclear reactors that use this hydrogen to helium reaction to generate power. In order to do that, they have to have enough mass to contain the heat and pressure that's created by their reaction. And so there's actually a mass threshold that in order for a body to be a star, it has to have that mass. Uh, and that is really the defining characteristic. You might say, well, well planets are, are you know, rocky. They're not made of gases. But that's not, that's not a fixed rule. Take Jupiter, for example. It's mostly hydrogen and helium. And if we were to take a spaceship to Jupiter and descend down through the clouds in our spaceship, hoping to find somewhere to land, we would be disappointed. The gas just gets denser and denser and denser mm -hmm. until eventually you're traveling through liquid. And so the difference between a gas giant and a star is really just that stars are above that mass threshold. There is actually this intermediate category of things called brown dwarfs. Um, and there's also a little bit of debate about should the formation mechanism uh, play a role, like planets form in orbit around a star, whereas stars and brown dwarfs form on their own. Um, there's, there's a little bit of debate about that, but the key thing to remember is that the defining characteristic of a star is that it is able to achieve nuclear fusion and generate its own power. Now the difference between a star and a sun, the term sun is kind of just used um, colloquially, but, but the convention is that a star is considered a sun if it has at least one planet orbit. So um, our sun is a sun. Uh, Alpha Centauri is a sun. Um, Sirius, we don't know if it's a sun because we don't know of any planets orbiting Sirius. Stuff like that. Very interesting. Um, uh, a, some, some interest in knowing more about uh, the more than 200 million galaxies. When and how were they discovered? Um, and, and do we assume that there are more to be found? So there are definitely more to be found. Um, the low surface brightness galaxies are chronically difficult to detect. So 200 million that we know of, cer certainly many, many more um, out there. In fact, uh, the most common type of galaxy is called a dwarf spheroidal. There's little tiny galaxies that are very, very old. And our Milky Way has about 100 of them orbiting around it. I think there's 50 known, but we estimate there's probably around 100. Um, and so you can, and those are almost impossible to see uh, at great distance. So we can almost safely take that 200 million and multiply it by at least 100 to get a, a conservative estimate for the total number of galaxies in the visible universe. Um, but where did that 200 million come from? So most of the galaxies that have ever been found are, are from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. There is a dedicated telescope for this project down in New Mexico which does nothing except survey the sky um, night in and night out, uh, looking for new objects. Um, it's, it's found a lot of stars, a lot of galaxies, a lot of quasars, uh, a lot of asteroids even um, have been detected through the Sloan. And so that number is coming from that survey. That's kind of the premier survey of the, um, the modern world. Some limitations though, uh, because it's in New Mexico, it cannot see the certain parts of the southern sky. Um, also, that Milky Way band goes all the way around the sky that blocks our line of sight of other galaxies. There's nothing we can do about that. They are setting up a southern telescope to do a southern Sloan, and there's even a new survey that's going to come out in a few years called the um, LSST survey that will um, be much better than Sloan. Um, that's also in the southern hemisphere. So that number you can expect to grow a lot, but remember that is really just known galaxies. There are certainly many, many more out there. Thank you. Um, can you comment on the recent news on possible axion discovery by Gran Sasso? Uh, is it Gran Sasso in Italy? Not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Gran Sasso is, um, is where the Lux experiment is located. 
And so axions are a candidate for dark matter. Um, and I don't know a lot about the details of that discovery, but um, if that ends up being real, even if it's not the dark matter particle, it would be significant to physics. So remember that the Lux experiment is just an all-purpose particle detector that's really, really sensitive. And so a lot of the work that they're doing is um, they're detecting all these particles. They have to kind of vet them out, right? So, okay, that one, that's, that's just a neutron. We know about those. Uh, that one over there that we just detected today, that's a neutrino. We ignore that one. Um, and then, you know, there's this very real possibility that they could detect other kinds of particles that are theoretical um, that haven't yet been found, even whether or not they are dark matter. So uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. But this is the kind of thing you get to discover when you build the most sensitive detector in all of history. Thank you. Um, we're coming close to time. We do have one more question here. And I'm going to share, as I mentioned, in the chat box where you'll be able to access a recording for, for this webinar. Um, and so the last question is, why is there warm dark matter and cold dark matter, et cetera? Ah, so uh, there are many different theories about what dark matter, what the characteristics it could have. The standard dark matter is um, cold dark matter, where the idea is it does not interact with every, anything ever. Um, warm dark matter is the idea that maybe we could break that rule a little bit. Maybe we could let dark matter interact with itself or with normal matter just a little bit. And actually, most theories about particle physics, like the premise of the, the Lux detector is that it should interact with normal matter just a little bit. And so technically, Lux is looking for warm dark matter um, in the context of galaxies, warm dark matter is sometimes invoked to explain uh, the, the core cusp problem. So another solution to the core cusp problem is uh, that maybe dark matter interacts with itself a little bit, and that creates a little bit of pressure, which prevents it from forming that cusp. And I'm going to be totally honest that I think that would be a really exciting thing to find. And that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in looking at UGC 731. Um, so best theories predict it should be cuspy because it's a primordial halo and that, or a nearly primordial halo. And um, if that's true, then um, that would be a landmark discovery. On the other hand, if it's not, then that might open the door to things like warm dark matter. I will say that that is not a, a favored theory um, by, by astronomers, um, by physicists, because in order to get this effect, you would have to have dark matter interact with itself so much that the Lux experiment would have already detected it. And so we kind of, um, that's largely discounted. And uh, I, I would be kind of shocked if it turned out to be that way. Uh, but who knows? As a scientist, I am open to, to every possibility and, and let the data guide me in my conclusions. Um, and I think it would be exciting if it were far weirder than we anticipated. Uh, it would also be exciting to verify these theories um, that we've developed. Awesome. Thank you but so much. There's many theories about dark matter out there, too. I will say that. Awesome. Jason Young, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, thank you. For all who are on with us today, thanks so much. Uh, there's going to be a brief survey immediately following the webinar. Thanks for sharing your, your thoughts on this particular event and um, what you'd hope to see down the road for, for webinars out of the Alumni Association. Um, we have another virtual back to class coming up next month. Um, it's on sports specialization for children. Is it better than training as a multi-sport athlete uh, with Dave Allen, who's a senior lecturer in physical education at Mount Holyoke? Uh, so we hope you might join us for that one as well. Um, it was great to be with you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a, a great rest of the day. Bye now. <laughs>